Lord, thank you for this day. <clears throat> thank you for the things that you're doing in our hearts, uh, in our church, in our friendships, and in this body here in Marlboro. We just ask that you would continue to use us as a light and that we would effectively communicate your love for people and uh, the seriousness of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to read verse 11 through 15. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promise promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Whew. Wow. That's a powerful few verses right there. Let's, and we'll take the next uh, 44 hours to talk about it, what is in there. No, we'll just take the next 25, 30 minutes and we'll see what is in there. And I want to, three specific things are in these few verses. And this is our understanding of the blood. And when we uh, we sing about the blood, don't we? Nothing but the blood, right? That one. And then there's uh, there's a lot of songs about the blood, right? Um, I won't I won't painfully sing them to you now, but uh, we sing about it, we read about it, uh, we talk about it, but do we know what it is? And this fits in our word series. Remember our series we started a while ago, words. Defining the words of our life, this is one of them, okay? So the blood. Um, <clears throat> this word is important in our faith, to say the least. It is one of the most uh, significant things of our salvation and so necessary for our fellowship with God. Necessary for our atonement and necessary for our fellowship and necessary for our hope. So there's three parts. There is uh, the blood is given as a sacrifice, one. The blood is cleansing, two. And then three, the blood is the seal of a new covenant. It's the sign of a new covenant. All right, so those, we'll go through those three points this morning. The significance of the blood goes all the way back, all the way back in the Bible, whenever God is fellowshipping with man, there is an idea of sacrifice. That we we cannot come to God in our flesh. We as unredeemed people cannot approach God because there is a barrier there. There is something that when we we attempt to get there, we run into something that restricts fellowship with him. And that something is sin. Not something what we have, we have produced and therefore the barricade is there, but it's something that is in our nature that we are sinners. And because we are sinners, there is a restriction in our fellowship with God. The conversation is not I am a sinner because I have sinned, but it is that I sin because I am a sinner. It's part of my nature, Romans chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first Adam. We all inherited this amazing ability to sin. We cleave to the dust, it says in, in Psalms. Imagine that, cle I cleave to the dust. It is my default mode. But because God is wanting fellowship with man, He created us for fellowship. He created us so that we could uh, understand him and walk with him and experience him and be with him in this life. He wanted that fellowship so that, so he made the sacrifice. He offered something that would take this barrier away 
that would take this barricade that I, that we as human beings constantly bang our heads into as we try to ascend to God. John 3.13 says that nobody has ascended to God. Nobody has ascended except the Son of Man who first descended. That there isn't anybody out there, no matter how good they are, no matter how right they are, that has ascended to God. They have all hit this barricade. They have all bumped into it. And they are all in need. We are all in need of the removal. But it can't just be removed. You know, you have a barricade out here. They're always doing road work. Now that the sun's out, the road work crews are out, right? Isn't that great? And then you, they, the barricade is up. No entrance, right? Road closed. Go that way. Go that way. Anywhere but this way. But how easy is it actually to park the car, pick the barricade up, move it over, and drive through? I don't recommend it, and if you do it, don't tell them I told you to do it. Right? It's easy, actually. You can do it. You can do it. You can ignore the law, or you can ignore the, the statement made there, and just do what you want and make your way somehow through it. You're going to annoy some people. You might you know, lose a tire in the process, but it's, it can happen. God cannot just remove the barrier and say, okay, go ahead. Okay, we'll let it slide this time. It has to be dealt with justly. Right? God is just. God is righteous. And he doesn't operate outside of his righteousness. Otherwise, he would not be righteous. So he, removing this barrier, had to give a sacrifice. And we see from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through the Bible, there is this understanding of sacrifice. It is given. And when the law is given to Moses on the Mount, on Mount Sinai, there is the law, right? The law. And how much of the law deals with sacrifice? All of it. The whole first five chapters of the book of Leviticus defines the sacrifices we make. And in every sacrifice, in every offering, there is blood. There is blood. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. That God cannot just walk over and just, it, here is the sin. Look at this convenient two by four just right there. Thanks, guys. Right? Like this sin, the two, the, the sin is there. That God does not just say, oh, Arthur. You're such a nice guy. You have such a nice haircut. It looks so good, right? It looks so good. You know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to just I'm just going to get this out of the way and you can come in here, right? That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. Arthur, there is sin there. Every one of us, there is sin there. It does not it was not removed without blood. The sacrifice to be made, there is a sacrifice to be made. Death is the penalty of this sin. Death. What? God, you're a little intense. It's a little intense. That is the way it is. This has to be dealt with. And we say, okay, I'll get to work. And he says, no, 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 no. We say, hold on, just give me a minute. I'll get to work. And we get working for God. We get working for God and we run our head up against this barrier over and over again, a little more refined in our flesh, a little more excited about it, a little more revamped, but still there it is. In order to remove this, God sent His Son, that Christ came and He shed His blood. He shed His blood as a sacrifice that the first aspect of the blood is a sacrifice made to God. It's not towards me, first of all. But first of all, God's justice has to be satisfied and there has to be a sacrifice made to meet that. That's why Christ is given to us. And it says that right here in verse 11 and 12. It says, When Christ appeared as a high priest of good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not in this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places. He entered once for all into the holy places where? In heaven. 
He says, uh, ten, not of this earth, not of this creation, not of anything that is coming from here, but he entered there in the holy places, the real, the holy places where God inhabits eternity by means of the blood, uh, not by means of the blood and goats, of goats and calves. That Christ did not ascend with a little bowl of goat blood, right? That is Leviticus. The blood of bulls and goats and gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of it. Millions of gallons of blood was shed in the Levitical system. We have an interesting idea of blood now. That when we watch TV, there's blood all over the place, right? We watch a medical drama. It's just, it's everywhere. We watch, uh, the action movies and the crime things and all this stuff. Everything has blood in it. But what is the context of blood? But then when we hear this context of blood given as a sacrifice, we cringe. We say, ooh, ooh, that's messy. That's messy. Ooh. And, but it's necessary. That is my, my sins, uh, issue right there. That God cannot come to me without this sacrifice, or I cannot come to God without this sacrifice first being made. But look what it did. The blood of, but, but by means of his own blood. Christ entered with his own blood as a necessary sacrifice. He entered into the Holy of Holies and he presented it to the Father. A necessary sacrifice, not a nice act, not a a cute thing, not an uplifting and encouraging thought, but a necessary death, a necessary sacrifice, and a necessary offering of the blood of Christ before the Father. And you know what it did? Thus, thus, and when he presented this blood, what did it do? Secured our eternal redemption. Having obtained our eternal redemption by the sacrifice of His blood. Not by my sacrifice of my work. Not by my sacrifice of my time. That is not the issue. The issue is there must be a sacrifice and it has to pay the price. Only the blood of Christ could pay the price. And in this offering, God is God is satisfied Imagine that. The wrath of God, the justice of God is satisfied with the offering of Christ. He was sacrificed for me. For me. In two ways. He was sacrificed for me in the sense that I am the one who deserves death. That I have by my sin earned something. And what have I earned? Death. He took my place in death. He took it for me. He has taken my death. But then also in this offering, He has taken on my sins. And He has washed them away from me. And God is satisfied. That's the second point. Let's get rid of this sin. It's removed, right? Removed by the sacrifice. The second point is that we are cleansed. Verse 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? When they brought these sacrifices, the the blood of bulls and goats, and they brought it to the altar, and they they put it on the horns of the altar, and they splashed it at the basin of the altar, and they poured it out there, there was a purification because this is the covenant that God had made with man. The idea that sin had been transferred to somebody else and blood had been offered, the idea of purification was there. But the purifying of the conscience, which is down deep inside of me, could not be purified. It could not happen because of this outward expression. But since Christ has brought the blood to the Father, now I am cleansed when I believe in it. When I believe that God is satisfied with it, then I say I am cleansed by it. I am cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. 
Hallelujah. Isn't that amazing that I am cleansed? That He has taken my sin, He has taken my trespass, my iniquity, my miss of the mark, my blatant rebellion against Him, my action that is missing God's purpose, and He has taken it and He has washed it away justly by the blood of Christ. And it says in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 that now we walk in the light. We walk in the light as He is in the light. And as we walk in the light, what happens? The blood of Jesus washes us as we walk with Him. What happens when you walk in light? Things are exposed. Right? Things are exposed. When we are saved, we are redeemed. There is no, there is no question about it. And we are washed in the blood. One time, it happens. But then also in my experience of this Christian life, as I walk with Him and as I live my life, I walk more and more in the light. And the more I walk with Him, the more things are exposed. Isn't that interesting? You get ready in the morning. I worked with a guy and he, he got ready early in the morning and he ran out the door and then we're, we're on our way to a meeting and I looked down and I said, what's wrong with your shoes? He said, what do you mean what's wrong with my shoes? I said, you have one black one and one brown one. Right? And he's like, ah, oh, man. Right? Ah, oh, man. Is that any way like our Christian life? Where I say, yes, I'm saved and hallelujah, amen. But at the moment of my salvation, there is no way to understand the depth of my depravity. At the moment of my salvation, there is no way to understand how much sin is in my life. And Christ doesn't make me understand. He doesn't put it on my shoulders. He doesn't say you have to repent for everything you ever done and you ever will do. I have no idea. But what He does is say, walk with me in the light. As a child of God, walk with me in the light. And we walk with Him in the light. And we say, man, this fellowship is amazing. Jesus, I love you. And we say, how come I have one black shoe and one brown shoe on? I never noticed that before. And He says to me, I know. I've been waiting for you to figure that out. You look funny, right? You look funny. Like my experience as a believer is a little, and then, but, but then it's in the lights. And I say, and then he washes me clean. As I, as I walk in the light, the blood is there still. And it doesn't say, whoop, gotta go back to the beginning. You missed the spot. Get, keep going. No, He is there. The blood is before the Father. And He's saying, Lord, they have uh, two missing shoes on. But it's not the issue. The issue is they are walking in the light. They are fellowshipping with you. And there will be a time when they realize that their shoes don't match. And you will wash them of that grave iniquity. But you will wash them clean. And then we say, Lord, I want my life to reflect you. And this sin is washed away from my life. And I walk with Him and He says, oh, by the way, there's this thing too. And we say, oh, and it puts a burden on us and it leads us to repentance. But our repentance is based on the blood of Jesus that is placed before the Father. And He does not say repent or else you cannot fellowship. He says repent and agree with the blood. Walk in fellowship. Walk in agreement with Me and be cleansed. You know what this does? He cleanses our conscience, right? In verse 14, He cleanses my conscience. What is wrong with my conscience? My conscience tells me that as I want to walk with God, but there is my something inside of me saying there is something wrong. There is something not right. And if my conscience is defiled, then I will not approach God because of that. And I cannot get to God because I am living in the defilement instead of agreeing with the lights and agreeing with the blood. But when Christ walked into the, into the uh, holy of places up in heaven and He presented the blood, then He washed my conscience and now I can come to God the Father where there is no barricade, there is no barrier, and I have freedom to walk with Him and my conscience is clean. Because I say I have freedom to walk with God. I have freedom to approach Him because of the blood of Jesus. Not because of anything that I've done. Not because of every anything that I've given. But because Christ has given His blood. Christ has offered it. Christ has done it. This is a cleansing. He washes us from all sin. All sin. I read in one place it says every sin. And I like that a little better. 
He washes me from every single sin. Every one. Don't hang on to any. Don't say that this one is holding me back. Don't say that I'm not going to come to God because I have this. The blood is saying, I have cleansed you from every single sin. God is satisfied with the sacrifice. God is satisfied with the blood. Will you be satisfied with the blood? Because how much of our lives do we spend in wrestling with our sin and saying, Lord, once I remove this thing, I'll be there. Just give me ten minutes. But then I walk out and he says, what's wrong with your shoes? And I say, dang it. And I walk back into the, and I come back out with something and it's not going to happen. Don't, don't, don't work. Trust in the blood. Be washed in the blood. Be cleansed by him. I read this last night from Watchman Nee and I just like this. He says this. He says it, uh, if, uh, he says it, oh yeah. When will you, go, when will you be good enough to feel that there is nothing wrong with you? so that you may come to worship with boldness. When's it going to happen? He's saying. And he's saying this question. He just did this whole paragraph about the blood. And then he says, let me ask you this boldly. When will you be good enough? When were you? When will your feelings get to the point where you say, okay, I'm good enough to come to God? All right? It won't. It won't. Because however I feel right now, I'll walk out in the light and I'll say, ooh, ooh. Oh, don't feel good now. It's not about how we feel. It's about the fact of the sacrifice that has been given and that sacrifice is the blood of Christ and it is enough. It is enough. Do you agree with God? Then he goes on to say, how long will you have to wait for such a day? How long, right? When will you take heart? And be able to burst forth in hallelujahs. Where is our worship based? Where is my, where is the spontaneous activity in my heart that says, I love you, Lord. Hallelujah. Where does that come from? Does it come from your achievement? Does it come from you saying, I finally feel good enough. I finally feel confident enough to walk to God. I finally feel like I have done enough work. Oh. You know what, this, how disappointing that is? You ram your head up against that barrier again. And you say, man, I thought I did it that time. But I burst forth in hallelujah. I open my heart in worship when I realize that somebody has made a sacrifice for me that is enough for God. And He has given it to me and it is all by grace and He doesn't require anything but that I believe and that I agree with Him. That is it. That is the gospel. That is the foundation of my worship. That I come to God based on Jesus, not based on me. If it was based on me, it wouldn't say there in Hebrews 9.11 that He came into a tabernacle not made with hands. It's a whole different, a whole different thing. And it cannot be me. It has to be Jesus. But because Jesus is given, I know that I have it and I have confidence, I have boldness to go into the place and worship Christ because of the blood of Jesus, because of his blood. I have freedom to walk with him and my experience is totally different. My experience is set free by God. Hebrews chapter twelve twenty four says the blood speaks better things than the blood of Abel. How did humanity get going? Adam and Eve, everything's perfect. They get kicked out of the garden. They have two sons. Okay, here's hope. One kills the other one. Over. Oh, from the get-go, we've been blowing it. Like It's not like we, we've evolved to this place of disappointing God. The first couple, it happened days into existence. I don't even know. It's what we do. Cain killed Abel. Cain killed Abel and his blood it says that it soaked into the earth the first time. What is it saying? Injustice, murder, guilt, shame, bad things. That's not speaking good things. But there is a blood that has been shed for you and me. It's the blood of Jesus and it speaks better things. It speaks better things. It says to me, your shoes are wrong, but that's okay. I have washed you in the blood. Approach me with boldness. Don't worry about you. Don't worry about your sin. Don't worry about your fear. Don't worry about your insecurity. Approach me based on Christ 
Have confidence in the blood and walk in it. You have been cleansed. You will be cleansed. And it is there before the Father. It's never getting old. It's always fresh. It's always a reminder of the sacrifice that was given for me. It's speaking better things. It's speaking about forgiveness. It's speaking about grace. It's speaking about sanctification. It's speaking about atonement. It's speaking about things that we cannot achieve here. And we can pour the blood of bulls and goats all over the place, but it will not speak the same thing that the blood of Christ speaks because it's a perfect blood. It's a perfect sacrifice and it's been offered and it's been, it is, it is with the Father. It is there. Amazing, the blood of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Eternal redemption. Eternal redemption. Not a momentary forgetfulness. Not a little, a little blip on the radar, but an eternal redemption. That's what we have by the blood of Jesus. There is an adversary in Roman, Revelations chapter 12. We have an adversary. Have you ever confronted him? Have you ever experienced any adverse thoughts or anything like that? How do we deal with an adversary like that? Who is accusing, who is accusing and bringing up things and da, 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 da. We present the blood. We remind him of the blood. We tell him to talk to our high priest who has brought the blood into the Holy of Holies and he has given it. And that's where the conversation ends. There's no nothing. He silences every adverse voice with authority and justice, with the blood. Sin put us outside of the garden. Like I said, Adam and Eve sinned and they got the boot from the Garden of Eden. Sin put us out. Satan had right and authority in Ephesians 2.13 as the prince of the power of the air. Or I'm sorry, Ephesians 2.3. But in Ephesians 2.13, Christ has made us near by the blood of the Lamb. The blood of Christ has made us near. Sin put distance between me and God. God was not happy about that. He didn't like it. So what did he do? Did he get tell me to get to work? No, he sent Christ. Christ got to work. And by the blood of Christ, I am brought near. I am brought back into fellowship with God. This is my experience. This is not an event. This It is not like a blip on the radar. But this is my experience. This is where I live. I live in nearness to God because of the blood of Christ. No other thing. It's the blood of Christ. The blood removes the barrier and God's inability to fellowship with us. He restores God to man, restores God to man, then man to God. And it is perfect. It is done. It is done. And then the final thing, it is the seal of a new covenant. All throughout the book of Hebrews, it talks about a better covenant, an eternal covenant. Hebrews 7.22, Hebrews 13.20. And then there's one mediator in Hebrews 12.24. One mediator. One mediator of this new covenant. His name is Jesus Christ. And He has brought the blood up to the Father. And He has sealed an unconditional covenant that God, that Christ made with the Father. He did not make this covenant with me. He did not call me to the floor and say, okay, this is what you have to do. This is what I'm requiring of you. He did not say that one second. He made it with Christ. Christ offered to the Father and there was a covenant made there that now man is free to come to God based on the blood. If I believe, if I receive this forgiveness, if I receive this cleansing, if I believe in Jesus then I have every right and every access to the Father because a covenant has been made when He shed His blood. We look for a sign in everything, don't we? We look for signs. How am I going to find my way to the church? We look for the sign, right? Tim saw the sign this morning. He said he was driving to another church. His daughter's at a hockey tournament, volleyball tournament. He said, I was going to another church. I said, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. He came into the parking lot. And hallelujah, all right? Looking for a sign. Look at, we look for a sign in everything. What is the, what is the qualification of this deal? How do, how can I stand on it? How valid is it? What is, what is enforcing this whole thing? The enforcement or the validity behind the sac, behind my salvation is the blood of Christ. It's the blood of Christ. This is how I know. This is the thing by which I know I have a standing with God is the blood of Christ. It has been offered and it is there. 
It is there. And we have an advocate with Jesus Christ. He's our mediator and he is there. And our accuser comes up against us. I come up against myself and there is stuff and he just says the blood. It's the blood. It's the blood. If you ever have a doubt in your salvation, what do you look to? Look to the blood. It sealed the covenant. It seals your salvation. Nobody can touch it. It is in the Holy of Holies up in heaven. The true Holy of Holies. Everything down here is a figure of what is there. And that it, it, there it is before the Father. My worship is based on it. My salvation is based on it. And the security of my salvation is based on the blood. It answers God's justice. It answers the devil's accusations. It answers my defiled conscience. And it it is the grounds for my new life. And ultimately, it will overcome the bite of death. Because of the covenant. The covenant has given me an eternal salvation. Based on the covenant, I have hope. Based on the covenant, I have an eternal future. And that covenant is sealed. It is sealed by the blood of Christ. It's the sign of it, right? We look... Look at the clouds are wispy. It's not going to rain, right? The clouds are buds. We look for signs all over the place. There's the blood is the sign of my salvation. Nothing can change it. Nothing can affect it. It is enough. It's enough. So in conclusion, that's it. The blood is enough. The blood is enough. Believe it. Believe that it's enough for you. Believe that it's enough for your brokenness. Believe that it's enough for your sin. Believe that it's enough for your salvation. Believe that it's enough for your brother's salvation, your sister's salvation. Believe that in the body of Christ we are washed in the blood of the Lamb. When we trust Him, we can shout out, Hallelujah. Can we? Hallelujah. I am washed in the blood. Say it with me now, right? That's my line in the play. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can't shout hallelujah based on my ability, but I can shout hallelujah based on the power of Christ that has overcome it all. All of it, it's done. It's done. And the blood is the seal of it. There it is, right? The fact is that the sacrifice is made. My experience is that I am washed in the blood. And my hope is that the covenant is sealed by the blood of Christ. That's it right there. Hallelujah. And we can eat matzah bread. I didn't know matzah bread was so doctrinal. That was amazing. It's broken. It's striped. It's pierced. It's amazing. My salvation is so perfect because of the perfect blood of Christ. Amen? Amen. Lord, thank You that You have saved us with this amazing salvation. And if there's anybody here who's never received Christ, you've never been washed in the blood, Just say in your heart, Lord Jesus, I need this. I believe that you were sacrificed for me. I believe that you washed me in your blood. I believe that you sealed my salvation with your blood. Just say yes to God in your heart. Lord, thank you. If you've said that prayer, just raise your hand real quick. We'll pray with you. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. One hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Bless the rest of our worship right now. A couple more minutes in your name. Amen.